Royals pitching prospect Walter Pennington joins the show and it has been a really fun year to watch you throw. I know Jack has got to see it up close and personal. I know you had a really good outing against his Indianapolis ball club. It's been fun to just watch what's been working for you so far this year. So congratulations on such a great start to the year. And thanks so much for taking the time to hop on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I got to just start with with what's going on this year with you. And, and just, I mean, last year I felt like was that step towards where you're at right now, where you saw the strikeout rate jump up. You saw a lot of metrics go in the right direction, but it feels like now is kind of that final form before the big leagues where you've taken another step forward. We're going to get into some details, and I know it's a very open-ended question here as to how that has happened, but are there a couple of things just like right off the bat that you could probably point towards that have really helped you take that next step so far this season? Because I know Royals fans are excited about you potentially helping their staff very soon. Yeah, so the biggest thing I think honing in on was the – not walking anybody and realizing um, when I look at the data as it becomes more widely available to me is that when I actually throw the ball in the zone and when the ball is put in play, there's actually not a lot of damage that actually happens. So when I have that realization of, okay, I can throw first pitch strikes without having a pinpoint, um, that helps a lot. And then also in spring training with the Royals really emphasized was the first pitch strikes, but also winning those one, one counts, which we call early and ahead. Uh, I guess there's a big difference between the count moving to two and one and the count moving to one and two. So when I really hone in and focus on those on the mound, um, it's kind of created what's going on right now. How have you gone about kind of getting ahead in that and, you know, making sure it gets to one, two, making sure it gets to oh one, because, you know, so much of what, you know, us like sitting up at the booth, what I'm talking about when you come in is the slider and it's like, Hey, the, the slider's kicking tail right now. But when it comes to actually getting ahead and you take a deeper dive into that data, are you seeing that you can do so with a fastball as well? Or is it, hey, I'm going to get my slider in the strike zone and we're going to figure this out? It's a little bit of both. Um, it's throwing that slider for a strike because they probably know it's coming. I throw it quite a bit. Being able to throw both for a strike and for a chase pitch. And also honing in on that fastball. Um, but I also added a cutter over the offseason with the help of Zach Bove in spring training. Still work in progress, but... That seems to help me grab those first pitches more easily. I was going to ask you about that cutter um, and 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 how you you kind of went about that because what's interesting is with the gyro slider, uh, you know, it's not as as big of a break, and and then the cutter. I feel like sometimes there can be some overlap, maybe there or some blending, but you're able to separate those two. And then th there's a little bit of difference with the fastball this year, so I'll get there in a second. But uh, how did you go about adding that cutter, and what was that process like for you? And and it, how does the grip compare to the slider and the fastball? Mm -hmm. So over the off season, I was trying to mess with it. I think the pitching coaches said it would be a good addition to the arsenal. And so I was trying to mess around with it. I messed around with it in college, especially when Kenley Jansen was killing it in the World Series. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of a trend then. But it, it never really clicked with me. And it's like maybe it just wasn't a pitch I could throw. Um, and then all of a sudden, Zach Bove comes up to me in spring training, I think as we were stretching one day, and shows me this new grip. And I'm like, I'll try it but I've tried a million different grips before this and it worked and it felt really great. Um, it's just an offset two seam. He said, just throw it with this grip, throw it like a two seam and it took off appropriately. Um, and it was really great to see how it played with my slider, especially those first couple of days of spring training. Interesting. So you mentioned seeing Kenley do it in the world series. Are you, you know, a guy in, you know, especially like, you know, four year guy, Colorado school of mines, are, are you somebody that was watching, you know, big league balls, seeing the best at, at the craft, you know, kind of try things. And then you would say, you know what, like, screw it. Let's try it in the bullpen today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's the dream, right? Is to yeah. watch those guys and do what they do. And you think that's the trend. Uh, yeah. And you mess around with it, but Kenley Jansen's arm slots a little different than mine. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Figured out, figure out a good grip that worked. Well, what do you think it is about, you know, your, your stuff. Cause I know I've listened to you on some other interviews and you kind of mentioned like, I don't, we don't totally know what makes my, my slider, what it is. It's kind of like that invisible. And, and, and a lot of those gyro sliders from certain release points can, can do that. Do you think it is the release point and, and kind of just how you, how you hide the ball pretty well? Or like, have you talked to hitters at all? Maybe about like what it looks like maybe when you have some live ABs, like, do you have any feedback as to, to why you're able to create such uncomfortable swings. Cause I love what you mentioned in the beginning too, which was even when it's in the zone and maybe you don't even nail your location, guys still aren't really squaring it up, which to me says I'm not seeing it that well. 
And I'm curious if, if anyone has said that to you, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from an analytics perspective, my stuff doesn't, it's not anything special. And so it doesn't really make sense. I still don't fully understand why this is happening. But when I faced Michael Massey in spring training uh, on one of the backfields, uh, Sweeney went out to him and I was like, what makes Wilson so effective? And he was just like, I can't see the ball. <laughs> um, I'm throwing a low 90s fastball and the uh, sliders around low 80s as well. It's just, I guess it's an invisible. And uh, I guess analytics can't really read that. I guess they just hide the ball well. But it's working. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's working, man. Um, no, I mean, you've got it. And the thing that kind of jumped out to me, too, was, you know, okay, if guys can't see the ball, it, it, do you think that's like a, a flight thing or do you think that's a slot thing or do you feel like you get down on the mound well? Like what before the ball leaves your hand do you feel like contributes to that? Uh, it's something I think with hiding the ball behind my head as long as possible and just how I throw. I don't know. I don't think it's an extension thing because those numbers aren't anything special. My release height, maybe my angle. I, I'm kind of confused, but that's okay. <laughs> well, I, it, what's what's fun too is, you know, you have an engineering background and, and you, you went to Colorado School of Mind. So like, I, I always love, and it seems like there's there's more crossover of folks that are have the engineer background and, and pitchers. Like they tend mm -hmm. to be pitchers. We've had a few mm -hmm. players uh, over the last couple of years on the show that have that background. So you, you mentioned data being more accessible and just, you know, I, I as a, I know Jack can speak to this too, like as a journalism guy, like when we were in journalism school, the joke was like, math is not our thing, like keep it away from us, blah, blah, blah. And like, I know probably a lot of athletes are probably the same thing. Like, I don't want to really look at math, but I know pitchers more than ever, I've become just very inquisitive and, and I would too, because you're getting this feedback that is unparalleled that we've never really had before. But then with your background, it's got to be like, twofold threefold the interest in in that feedback and that information uh, how fun was that for you to start to dive into your stuff with the information that is now available mm -hmm. uh the analytics really i think became popular my the end of my college career uh the rap soda numbers especially understanding what vertical and horizontal break are spin rates and all that um so it was really cool to dive into it from a physics perspective and actually looking like how the ball is working what the laces do to it and i still am interested in that but it's one thing to do it. It's another thing to know how to do it. So yeah, I can tell myself I need my spin rate up or I need more horizontal break. But what I feel and what I know are kind of two opposite things. So uh, my college coach and uh, he's my pitching coach. Um, my senior year, he told me I have a one thought limit. I'm not allowed to think about those things because I can get in my head and it never goes well when you're thinking. Yeah. How do you scratch that itch away from the ballpark if you do the the engineering itch? Because, you know, I know Kevin Kelly, who came up with the Guardians and is now in Tampa, like he was doing some coding for NCAA.com. And Ryan Lutis was, you know, doing some, uh, you know, front office, just like data entry work for the Cardinals because he needed to scratch that itch. Do you scratch it? Is it a Lego thing or is it something else? Oh, I love Legos. Um, yeah. Initially, it was helping my <laughs> sister with her homework, uh, but gotcha. she graduated. Um, I, I like to build things with my hands and like create those things in the off season, like with some carpentry work. Um, but sometimes it's just watching YouTube videos. I have a really big interest of why things work and how things work, the way they work and understanding that. So just figuring out on YouTube, gotcha. those things. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I want to go all the way back to, to your high school career too. And you know, Colorado is not necessarily the, the, a hotbed for, for baseball, but we're starting to see more talent come out of there. And I, as we're seeing just in general, there's so many more talented athletes across the whole country. You can, you can find people anywhere, but I also know that especially for folks that are, you know, in their mid twenties now, like getting recruited eight, nine years ago, or, or even five, six years ago was a totally different process. And I think for people that were in Colorado or some of these other places, it can be a little bit harder to get recognized by other schools and, and just get seen. For, what was your recruitment process like and, and how much was, was your priority going to the right school for your engineering background and, and what you want to do there versus, you know, playing baseball? And were you even really thinking that professional baseball was, was a path at that point? Mm -hmm. So I've always dreamed of being a professional baseball player. And that dream becomes more and more real as you make your teams of uh, varsity baseball in college and then getting that college scholarship or whatever showcase. And then, like there's checkpoints along the way. Um, and that dream just kept becoming more and more real for me. 
Um, so I would play in those showcases in Arizona. Uh, that was my first, I think, when I really reminisce about this, I, I, I was kind of seen at an Arizona showcase. Uh, I think we were playing at the Padres in Seattle complex. And there was this academic game. Uh, you have to have a certain GPA in order to try out for the academic game. And then if you make the team, you play later that day. So that morning, I threw a bullpen in front of scouts. And my GPA was good enough to have that tryout. And then I went and played either one or two games with my regular team. And then I got a call that day that I'd be playing that night pitching. And so um, I played throughout the day, and I pitched well enough. And that's when recruiting really stepped up for me. And a lot of junior colleges, um, our school minds hadn't reached out yet, and maybe some preferred walk-ons happened from that. Um, I really had that affinity for math and science my whole life, and so when I was looking at colleges, there were no, really no D1s I could go to. So I was like, all right, how can I do engineering and keep this baseball dream alive? And then I realized there's one that's 30 minutes from my hometown that I figured could work. So they allowed me to do engineering at the school of mines, and I thought the baseball program was up and coming and could keep that dream alive. It really made that decision simple when they reached out to me and offered me a little scholarship. I love that. So it's one thing to keep the dream alive. It's another thing to grab it and run with it. And the process of grabbing it and running with it had to be as weird for you as any draft cycle in human history. So season shuts down March 11, March 12, whenever it was. What's the process that that goes on for you? And, you know, maybe the Royals, if you have any idea, you know, from that point through when you signed with Kansas mm -hmm. City. Mm -hmm. So I was five weeks in my college senior season uh, when everything shut down. And so I was kind of confused. Am I even going to get my season back? Yeah. At least I'll have my degree. Maybe I'll go be a normal engineer. And then when I heard that the NCAA was giving our season back, I started training at a facility with the driveline. I was like, all right, let's throw a little bit harder. Let's go out with a bang this next year. I'll get my master's degree, hopefully with the scholarship, and then I'll just go be an engineer and just play out my last year of baseball. As I kept training, I was throwing a little bit harder, and I think Kansas kind of stayed open, and they had the NBC World Series, which is a summer ball tournament at the end of, at the end of summer. I played in it, but you just passed with my summer ball team. But as I was training at this facility, they had a team that was playing in this Kansas tournament. And they're like, well, why don't you go pitch in front of some scouts? So I played on this team. I went out for four innings with a team I never played with before. Yeah. And I went through four innings, didn't think anything of it, but I was sitting 91, I guess. After the game, I'm walking from the bullpen to the field on the phone with my brother trying to figure out where to go eat. And some guy from the stand says, hey, Pendleton, you got a second. Yeah, what's up? It's like, you're interested in signing a professional contract? I'll call you later, Reese. And it ended up being Matt Price. And just like that is one game where my dreams were being realized. Like, there's all this confusion about, oh, I'm done with baseball, I'm going to go be an engineer. And all my dreams had been realized, and look at where we're at now. Wow. It is a crazy, crazy how it happened. So that's like one of those, you know, one of the, like, cliches that I know, like, we've probably heard our whole career of playing baseball or anything, or just really a lot of things in general. It's just like play like someone's watching, you know, kind of thing. And I know that you were, you were given a little bit of a heads up that, you know, there were going to be scouts there, but I'm sure you've heard that plenty of times when you're about to get on the mound and then you, you get, you throw well or whatever, you may be a little excited. You don't hear anything because you, you never know what's going on in that, in that given moment and who actually showed up and, and who was there. I feel like that's as perfect of an example as, if you go about your business every single time and, and, and pitch the way that, you know, you want to pitch, if it's a big game, you never know who's watching and you never know what can happen. Cause I'm curious where that lined up in terms of the anticipation of something potentially happening and, mm -hmm. and compared to maybe other instances where you got on the mound and thought there could be high stakes there and nothing came of it. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing now. Like you think you perform well and you're not getting promoted or you do get promoted and someone is always watching. So it's always good to, have that in mind and give it your best, but also to pray, play freely. You can't have that in the back of your mind. You just got to go out there and, and have fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, and my favorite thing about professional baseball, minor league baseball in particular, is, you know, this is as close to a true meritocracy in sports that we have. 
right? Because if you play well, if you have a two ERA, if you hit, you know, if you OPS 900, chances are you're going to get a shot at, at the next level. And, you know, the thing is, like, you controlled your destiny through this. When did you kind of realize, you know, was it 21? Was it 22 last year when you really did control your own destiny and, and you really had a shot to get to the pinnacle of this game? Mm -hmm. Well, there's little checkpoints again along the way where you realize, hey, you can do it. I guess there was some doubt going into pro ball. I was surrounded by all these D1 guys, big name guys, and I'm here from a D2 that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> and I'm just playing catch with them. But then I realize, hey, they're just normal guys. When I get in that first game and you realize my pitches still play here, and you get promoted to the next level, my pitches still play here, okay, and you get to AAA, okay, kind of dominating. I can do this. And then big league spring training. Oh, this is the same game? Hitters still have a hard time hitting. Um, there's those little checkpoints that have really affirmed um, and given me confidence that, hey, I can do this. I'll bet. Has there been any difference with your your fastball this year? Um, you know, I know like it can be a marginal thing in, in TrackMan, but end up being something that makes a, a little bit more of a difference. From a shape perspective, it's like slightly different, but that could also just be something a little bit unintentional. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would love to hear just kind of the rest of your arsenal and, and how you go about that because the cutter does you know, add another wrinkle to, to what you have. Um, and, and obviously takes a little bit of pressure off of needing to throw the fastball as much when you have the slider mm -hmm. and the slider command that you have. Like, where are you at with the fastball as well? And, you know, how do you mix that in uh, without, you know, taking away from the pitches that you know are, are probably your best? Mm -hmm. So last year I was pretty, I've been working on my changer, but I was pretty much two pitch mix um, type guy with the sinker and the slider. And adding that cutter in is, yeah, freed up my, from not using the sinker so much. Um, unintentionally, how it's affected my fastball or being the cutter and the slider, I'm on the side of the ball a lot more now. And that might it might affect my heater somehow. Um, metrically, it's been not as consistent, I guess, and I don't know if that's been a good thing. Um, but lefties seem to have a hard time with sinker still. Um, but just yeah, figuring out how to pair those pitches together has been a, a big key too. Like, what are the hitters saying? What does the scouting report say? And how can I kind of throw that wrinkle in there with the two seam? You know. How is your arsenal, you know, really adapted when it comes to, yeah, I guess splits. Like you got into it a little bit there. Your sinker still plays against lefties, but you know, you're going a lot longer than just being a situational mm -hmm. guy where, Hey, you're going to see, you know, two lefties over the course of a given inning and, and you got to get them out using your slider. How has your approach against right-handed hitters? How has your approach against left-handed hitters really changed and adapted? Mm -hmm. I mean, the cutter opens up a lot more. Instead of pitching with that sinker inside to right-handers where it's coming back into the barrel, of uh, kind of front-hipping them instead and accidentally maybe leaving it over the plate and going really back in their barrel, I can throw that cutter, which starts maybe at their barrel and cuts in. So I'm seeing a lot more broken bats in that sense. Um, and then lefties, just giving them another look. If they're seeing if they're tunneling it well, I can go cutter and throw them off. Um, it just gives me another weapon to... And sure, let him kind of throw them off. Yeah. Jack kind of teased what my next question was going to be, which is the role. Uh, because, you know, we've seen you go four innings uh, in relief and uh, you went four shoddy. It was four perfect against Jacksonville uh, a, a month ago. But then, you know, we've also seen you go in just for one inning and, and, and come in for that one shutout inning of relief. More recently, it's been more two to three inning spurts here and there. You know, what has the team kind of communicated to you about what your role is, like could be at the big league level eventually? And, and is there any, um, you know, floating of kind of like this swing man type? Like, are you, do they ever like, consider making, having you make starts or is it more of this, this long relief kind of Swiss army knife type of approach? Mm -hmm. I haven't been told too much. I'm just <laughs> always ready. And I want to pride myself on being versatile and whatever they need at the big league level. I want to show them I can, I can do it with them. I want to be a closer, setup guy, start, whatever they need. Um, so not much to be communicated, but uh, those longer inning stints have been really good for me and pushing me to be able to pitch in a different way. I'll tell you, game two of the doubleheader, he looked like Sandy against us. Like, <laughs> the dude started game two of a doubleheader, and I'm like, okay, here we go. Uh, but no, man, I mean, your ability to go long, do you – do you kind of change when you know that you'll be able to go long where, hey, I can empty the tank here across one inning? I, I feel like 
you know, your, your velocity numbers. Cause I saw you in a one inning spurt. I saw you in a four inning spurt mm-hmm. and it, it really felt like the same guy spread out over four innings sustainability. How do you go about that? Is it, is it a mental thing or is it just something that happens for you? Yeah. I, I think it's just something that happens because when I pair, prepare for those spot starts, I don't prepare like a starter. I go out and throw at the relievers early and then I'll go straight to the bullpen right before the game and act like the starter couldn't get out of the first inning. Gotcha. So I treat it similarly. Um, and it's not really a mental thing that I need to save up. I mean, that, that time I went four innings, uh, Dane went up to me and he said, all right, you got to start tomorrow. Like how many innings do I got? Two to three. Okay. I can do that. I've done that before. And it just happened that it was a quick four. Uh, it was just a subconscious thing. Gotcha. Yeah. 44 pitches <laughs> to get through yeah, those four I innings. I mean, okay. I get that, that's as efficient as, as can be. And then even, you know, the, the, the stint that Jack was mentioning as well. I mean, 40 pitches to get through three innings there with, with, with six punchies. Uh, yeah. what, what stands out to me, I guess, is, is the fact that those two, two of your longest outings this year have been the most dominant. Of course, we're going to have more of a sample to work with here. So it's, you're going to naturally be able to strike out more guys when you face more guys. But I just think it's, it's impressive that, you know, as you get stretched out there a little bit further, you seem to almost elevate your, your game a little bit and, and, and attack hitters maybe on a, on a different level. Is, is that you wanting to see how long you can go and being, you know, a little bit more aggressive? Cause you mentioned like, attacking the zone more this year has been something over the last two years, something that you realize, Hey, I can, I can do this. Guys aren't squaring me up. Do you have that almost to another degree when you know that you've got a longer leash and, and, and is there like a, a motivation to see how many innings you can go knowing you have to be efficient to be able to do it? I suppose you could say that sometimes when I'm throwing out that first start, we're trying to save pitching or hurt for pitching. So of course you also have the motivation to save the bullpen and go as long as you can, but also those longer stints allow me to really settle in and I can feel, Whereas those one inning stints, like you can't really make those adjustments. You have to work with what you've got. Whereas multiple innings, you can go in and talk to the pitching coaches, talk to the catcher, see what they see and really make those adjustments uh, over a longer period of time. So kind of building off that, say you, you enter and you know, you're going to go an inning, inning in the third inning in two thirds, and, and you just don't have something. You don't have the cutter. You don't have the slider. Have you, you know, found a, a not a shortcut because there's there's no right way to go about it, but have you found a remedy to kind of counteract that immediately? Or is it one of those where, hey, you need to abort mission and go somewhere else, you know, and, mm-hmm. and work with the two pitches in your arsenal? And I, I'm sure that elevated the importance for you of adding that cutter full time really mm-hmm. going this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, whereas last year, if I didn't have the slider and I relied heavily on the sinker, that's easy to catch on to. Um, I think a big thing is just it's, I'm still learning this. I think I'll be constant learning those adjustments. So yeah, I'm making those adjustments in game, one thing at a time. Like I said, one thought limit, try yeah. one thing at a time. Uh, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and you're gonna have to compete. I think mean, that's what makes pitchers great is when you can battle through those days. Yes. Hopefully, you don't have a lot of them. But yeah. I've definitely had a couple of them. You mentioned Zach Bove off the top and how he kind of approached you with that cutter grip and you know I, I just can't help but think about what's happening with the royals across the board you have free agents who have come over veterans that you know are, are throwing the ball as well as they ever have I, and you know you could credit different people for that but then you also have a guy like cole reagan's coming in and and just totally looking like an, a different pitcher you have a lot of different pitchers throughout the system that have taken a step forward and we know that it's a lot of new faces uh, in charge you know in kansas city and i think we're seeing a lot of good things happen as a result can you speak to the pitching development side because you know again i know that they got in the lab with you like you were able to go through things that you do well and and maybe what what isn't as doesn't come as easy for you and 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 create that plan of attack and clearly it's working so i I just feel like it's got to be happening across the board here what have you seen from the pitching development standpoint in kansas city and and you know what can you speak to about the direction that that is heading in and and how that has the organization kind of trending so i spoke to this earlier the data analytics becoming more and more prevalent um, earlier in my career and at first it's kind of hidden from us and then it was all of a sudden thrown at us and we didn't know what to do with it there's all this information we didn't know how to deal with it uh, and I think especially last year and this year uh, they're streamlining it they've taken all this data and yes they're making it available to us but they're also translating it to us now like okay we're gonna make this simple like like we talk about the walk rates and the first pitch strikes yeah. Okay, that's the only thing you need to look at. Don't worry about these other numbers. So they've really helped interpret that better, which I think makes it easier for these pitchers to say, well, not overthink it. 
and just simply focus on one thing. If you want to get to the big leagues, here's the one thing you need to do. It makes it easy. Who, who's that kind of person that's translating for you? Is it is it a pitching coach in triple? Is it, you know, somebody that's even on the support staff? Is it, you know, a type of, you know, data science coordinator that, that mm-hmm. Omaha has in the clubhouse? Who is it? Uh, so we have all those types of people, but it was it really in the off season when Stetter and I sat down and gotcha. looked at it, and he's like, "This is all you need to do." But all the pitching coaches are great in in translating it or interpreting it in a simple way. Hey, does Kansas City lead the league in vibes? I, I mean, your <laughs> Royals vibes are immaculate in Omaha. It seems like there's positivity. I get to text back and forth with Nick Batters a lot, who I, I know you know well. But man, it seems like you guys are are just smiling, going to the ballpark every single day, and Unfortunately, like I know there are a lot of teams, both at the AAA and the big league level, where you know the smiles are few and far between in the clubhouse, but it seems like you guys just radiate this positive energy. What does that do for you just on a daily basis? Yeah, winning is fun. Uh, <laughs> last year, even the year before, we had some pretty tough seasons, so I know the dreaded feeling that that can be. But it's really fun to just come to the field, and when people are smiling, it's contagious. And I like to pride myself in doing that even when – we're not winning, but we just came off a four game losing streak, and uh, it was good to feel that again yesterday. I'm sure. Just from the, uh, the the pitching staff in general, we were talking about it before we started recording. I mean, some of the best numbers in in minor league baseball, and especially in AAA. Uh, who who on the staff? And I know you're you're contributing to that uh, with with your 39 percent K rate, but who on the staff do you think deserves a little bit more uh, maybe shine or attention that you know has really impressed you in AAA is. You, know, you, th- you watch your throw bullpens with them or just watch them go about their business, you know, a- in a game setting uh, that you think mm-hmm. maybe deserves a little bit of love. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, first it was Sam Long. He was my throwing partner. Um, and he was just like uh, the silent assassin in my eyes. He wasn't very loud or anything, but he'd go out and dominate every time. And then Alta Villa, who just got called up, he, another quiet guy, goes about his business. Uh, also a guy who smiled a lot, um, attack, but he, he got his uh, shiny moment. Uh, but now I think it's Sam Sis or Evan Sis. Yeah, uh, he's killing it, and like he goes about his daily business. Uh, whether he has success or not, he's even keel. Um, he's my roommate too, and uh, just as a fellow lefty, we want to root for each other and competing. We're almost pushing each other to get better at competing, maybe silently competing with the ERAs, but just makes us both better. I he's killing that. it right now, though. I love that. Yeah, he was um, he was the Michael A. Taylor reliever arm. I know you get Sisk and somebody else confused, and you're like, who's in the Michael A. Taylor? <laughs> Tim it's Tim Heron. I Tim for whatever Heron. reason, Tim Heron. Um, Tim Heron, yeah. Evan Sisk, but he's weird, man. Like it, it's yeah. a fascinating, fascinating release, and you know, it's it's higher velo from that release too. It's very. I love Ryan Walker. Like I'm obsessed with what Ryan Walker is doing in San Francisco right now. Yeah. Sisk is. You know, kind of same thing where it's super weird and, and Velo shouldn't jump out of his slot like that. I don't get it. It makes me feel bad that I'm not for one harder. It's on 94, 95 down there, and I can barely get 92 from here. But he's kind of like Schreiber. I was watching Schreiber now. He's throwing like mid 90s from down there. I don't know how they do it. I, get, I asked him yesterday, how do you do it? <laughs> I was going to ask you, like, just with your, your curiosity, you know, I think about how you said, you love to know how things work and, and learn how, how things are created. For for me, and I can relate to that, obviously I'm not playing professional baseball, so I have a lot more bandwidth to dive into how that happens on a baseball field. Does that curiosity happen for you with, with other players and other pitchers when you watch someone like Schreiber do something? Or I could also understand if I was in your position, I'd be like, I don't need to watch anybody else right now. Like I, I spent enough time at the baseball field. But for me, that's where my curiosity goes and being able to speak to people like yourself. But it, does that curiosity maybe ever send you down the rabbit hole of other pitchers uh, that maybe you don't even know, like diving into, you know, we just had Griffin Cohen on, on one of my closest buddies in AAA with Jacksonville, who, again, that was where I first kind of saw what you were doing. I was watching that game and that's where you just piece them up. But he has a, just a, a general curiosity in swings and he will just watch all different swings, all different levels and just loves it. Uh, but I know that's kind of rare. Uh, do you find that with pitching at all? Yes. Um, I always think it's fun to see how guys throw harder um, and to delve into that, uh, even to a fault sometimes. Um, I've had to kind of temper it a little bit because I don't want to overthink it. I don't want to change the picture that I am because what I'm doing is working. Yes, it'd be nice to throw harder, but I don't want to lose that. Um, so to temper it. But I think it's awesome to see 
how one thing works for some guys, other things work for others. Like some guys stay out of the weight room and they throw hard. Some guys hit the weight room heavy and they throw hard. Um, there's just so many options and it, you just got to find the one that works for you. Yeah. Who's the guy that you feel like, I don't know, you've just been enamored with at the big league level that it's like, I don't know how you do it, but you do it. And, and I can't stop watching you. Is there a guy yeah. that comes out to you about that? Uh, it, well, it was a role as Chapman back then. And then even Josh Hader, um, yeah, I try to stay away from it right now. <laughs> yeah, again, it's it is working, but yeah, any guy who throws hard as clunky mechanics, it's just awesome to see how they figured out how to use their body most efficiently. I, so I, I I did the rundown, and and you you pretty much answered it already because I was going to ask you know how you've been able to cut that that walk rate down consistently while dealing with the ABS, and Jack has been a big proponent of of how difficult it is for for pitchers to continue to fill up the zone because <clears throat> the zone is what it is. And it's something totally different than anybody's really used to with, with this ABS system. Obviously the answer to that in short is the way you're attacking hitters. But beyond that, how have you managed that ABS system? Because I do feel like, you know, if you're have this course of attack now that, that you clearly feel like is working, we might not actually be totally seeing the results of, of how that could really manifest itself in the walk rates. Of course they've gone down, but, you know, I think if there's no ABS, do you feel like those walk rates could be even lower? And how have you managed that? Yeah, uh, there's been a lot of close calls recently. Some are replaying <laughs> in my head from last night, too. Um, yeah, the ABS has been tough with, it seems like there's no top of the zone. And sometimes it seems like the bottom of the zone isn't consistent. I know it changes hitter to hitter, and I know it definitely changes park to park. Um, but it just makes me that much better. It calls you higher. You got to throw uh, more competitive pitches and just see what you can do. But the cutter's been big in getting that first pitch strike because sometimes I can throw it off the plate and it comes back in. Uh, yeah, just calls me higher, dude. It, the thing that you know makes me scratch my head more and more whenever I hear it is that it changes park to park. And you know, it, it was to the point. I think year one was what twenty twenty two where ABS was like fully utilized, and twenty two I was talking to hitters and they were like, "I like it." <laughs> I'm like, "Of course." Are, are you sure? <laughs> And now, I mean, we talk to hitters and it's like, oh, I don't like it. It seems like, and I'm not asking you, hey, are you firmly pro or are you firmly anti? I just see so many holes in, especially the Tuesday through Thursday games where it's the full ABS and there's just, there's zero give. There's something about human air from somebody that's not in it. Is there something endearing about the umpire's job and human air for you that makes the Friday through Sunday a little bit more enjoyable for you? Yeah. Oh, I guess recently I'm observing the umpires are calling less and less strikes that they're okay with missing. I haven't seen strikes missed that have been fully in the zone. Yeah, that's that's not okay. But uh, especially when you're struggling or need a three zero strike count and it's that close, the umpire's gonna give it to you. Right. I'm sure that's all it takes to get you back in the zone. But ABS has been very unforgiving. Yeah, um, yeah, you see a lot of challenges that miss by less than half an inch and it's like how can a system be that perfect yeah it's not my call <laughs> hey walter last thing for me um if i'm not mistaken i saw something you're, you're a new dad right i am how many hours of sleep are you getting right now because of my superhero wife um i'm getting i'll go to bed about an hour earlier so i can make up for it so like eight still it's okay good. Wow. it's not too bad that's, that's but really my poor sad. wife she is a superhero. She allows me to do this. <laughs> Love that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, congratulations on that front. And and so the last question I have is <clears throat> just looking at what the Royals are doing at the big league level, and and just you know you you, you got to be a part of that group with with big league spring training, and you know you, you you also are just right there knocking on the door. You got guys going back and forth all the time, offensively pitchers, and and you know that you're performing in a way that. For this team, you can absolutely help them down the stretch. How exciting has it been to watch this team succeed? And and really, Jack alluded to the vibes. It's it's a young group. It's it's a very talented group. Uh, when when you're right there, yeah. You know, how often are you keeping tabs with with what the the big league team is doing? And and it's got to be so much more fun to keep those tabs when you know they're in the playoff hunt and and they're they're just playing really infectious, enjoyable baseball right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got to watch yourself playing GM. Um, I'm definitely rooting for them. I don't want to. I don't want to get promoted because of someone's lack of success. 
I want to kind of outcompete them and earn that spot. That's uh, the impression I'm under. But I do like to watch those games and see how like Sam Long is doing, how Altaville is doing, or these guys that I met in spring training. Because um, they're doing great things, and it's really fun to watch. And I do think it's contagious in, in AAA too. Like, shut up the vibes. Uh, it's been really fun to win, and I know it's been fun to win up there too. It's got to be fun to watch Bobby Witt Jr. go about his business too, right? <laughs> it's nice he's on your side. He's a different animal. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> but yes, I'm glad he's on our team. Is, is there that just spurred one more thought? I'm sorry. Uh, was there anybody in those live ABs during uh, spring training or anything that you're just like, man, this is a grind of an at bat, uh, or like uh, th- this guy can just really get to anything? Yeah, those lefties were giving me trouble. They threw in like four lefties my first live, and I'm like, okay. And it's different because you don't want to hit them, but also right. in my mind, if I'm going sinker, I'm gonna hit you. I'm gonna get it in there. That's the uh, the competitive mindset that I have, but. Uh, Prado has a great eye. He stands so close to the plate. Uh, Massey, too, even Isbell. All of them were grinds, especially early. Uh, I'm glad that they're, again, on our team. Yeah, Massey's been having an awesome year. I know that's a, a big favorite of, of Jack, uh, one, of, one of Jack's longtime favorite guys to watch go about his business. But, uh, Walter, thank you so much for taking the time, man. It's, it's been so fun to watch you go about your business this year and, and see you do what you're doing and very excited to see how the rest of the year goes for you and and excited to see hopefully uh, help the Royals make that playoff push you know, as we get deeper into the season. But congratulations on all your success, and we really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, and thank you for your time.